Hello, I'm Yuan Kai from Vanderbilt University. Uh, this presentation is to summarize my thesis work, which basically my PhD thesis presentation. Uh, the title of my thesis is Structural Medical Image Analysis Using Consistent Volume and Surface Image Processing. Well, first, I would like to show uh, what is structural image analysis and what we are doing. Basically, we want to get the quantitative information from uh, uh, MRI or CT scan or ultrasound scan, and we from segmentation, landmark detection, or classification, we can get quantitative information. For example, here we can get more than 100 brain regions and the whole brain surfaces from MRI scan. So, to summarize the structural medical image analysis, is that we acquire a whole bunch of medical images from the scanners, then we do the image processing to get. Uh, segmentation and the surface screen, etc. Basically, the quantitative information from a pure qualitative image. And then we can do the data analysis, basically, regression, classification, etc., whatever, based on the feature that we grab from the image processing. And my CDS is focused on the image processing and data analysis, and we'll not do the uh, image set because there's more physics side. So, the issue that traditionally people investigate the medical image on the small scale, like people typically have a cohort less than 200 scans, and these images are typically collected from uh, one scanner, which means the images are very homogeneous. And now we are in the air of the big data. Here the definition on the Wikipedia is that, okay, the data is so large, and our traditional image processing method is not able to deal with the big data set. The reason that we have a new challenge is that we need strong computational resources, we need to deal with the big intercept variations, we need to deal with intensity harmonization, and we hope our method should be robust on all these big data sets. Well, everything has two sides, right? It gives us challenges, but also gives us opportunities, like it helps us to understand the population beta better with the big data, and we can do the personalized medical image, and we can integrate with the medical informatics, and of course, when we have a large data, we can do the deep learning, which is very popular in this year. So this is the special issue of the medical image analysis journal. It says, well, the future of the medical image analysis is big data and deep learning, and I'm fortunate that I could participate in those two sides, and my research uh, lens on brain and the whole abdomen. So in this presentation, I will first briefly introduce the brain, then introduce the abdomen. Here is a big picture of my brain research. Like after we acquire the big data, we do the uh, image segmentation and using multi-atlas segmentation. And we would like to speed it up using machine learning technique. And when when we have a whole bunch of uh, images, we can do the personalized image processing. And of course, we can do the population analysis. And uh, when, since we have a whole bunch of training data, the X, which means subjects, was very big, which has long dimension. And uh, compared with X, the matrix for each subject is typically small. So what we want to do is we want to have as detailed as possible segmentation and as detailed as possible surface reconstruction to deal with the Y way less than X problem. And from our method, we can get more than 200 volume and surface features from a single MRI T1 image. Next thing is to deal with intersubject variation, basically the variation on X. So we introduced the uh, TICV segmentation method to get the TICV, the total intracranial volume. Then we can use that to correct X. And once we get X and Y, we can do the uh, statistical analysis or data analysis to mine the big data. And finally, we can apply it on an application called Brain Agent, which investigates the lifespan brain volume change uh, for more than 5,000 patients. Here's a big picture of the abdomen. Here is also we acquire a whole bunch of abdomen images. We first try the multi assimilation we also try the deep learning and try the synthesis learning and we applied on uh, whole brain body assimilation split and omega assimilation and uh, this is the uh, uh, renal correction system in the kidney and also i didn't show here that we also uh, do the multitask learning which we will show in this presentation which we do assimilation the landmark detection simultaneously first let's 
introduce the multi-atom segmentation. Well, the multi-atom segmentation is the uh, example-based segmentation, and it was the state-of-art segmentation method before deep learning came. And when I started my PhD, and at least the first two years of my PhD, this one is still the best segmentation method we can have. So the idea is that we manually label a whole bunch of representative uh, MRI T1 image, and uh, now we have the T1 and the labels. And when a new patient comes, we don't have to do the uh, time-consuming manual segmentation again. Instead, what we do is we do the retration, which basically register each atlas to the target image, and we ha have the deformation field. And uh, we apply the deformation field on the T1, then we get the norm, uh, registered the T1 and the segmentation, and we use the step called the label fusion to fuse each uh, segmentation to a better segmentation. The idea is very similar to the computer vision community that we have the uh, other boost learning, which we can uh, boost in the several weak learner to be the better learner. This is the idea. And our lab uh, focus on the label fusion part in this. Here is multi asset label fusion. So there are basically two major strategies. First is voting based fusion. So we can think of this problem as the president election. So in a lot of countries, like in China or Europe, we do the majority vote. This is one uh, labor fusion strategy, is that who get the largest voting across the population who get to win the president. But in some country like US, different state have different weight. For example, even here, only two states vote red, but once it has bigger weight, the red can still win. So it is a weighted vote, which basically gives each reader a different weight. Also, we have another family called the statistical label fusion. For the statistical label fusion, we not only consider the rating at this time, but we also consider the spatial temporal relationship between the readers. Uh, and here example, for example, okay, we can see the results in blue, but we've realized that one of the blue is a uh, red state, for example, Alabama. And we think it cannot be happened. So we use expectation maximization algorithm to update the results. Finally, we can get the reasonable results. And uh, uh, this method called the non-local spatial staple, which was proposed by uh, our lab. And I also uh, contribute on the liberation theory for the longitudinal image. So basically, uh, I proposed a method to do the longitudinal joint labor fusion. Here is the framework of the uh, network, which basically considers the spatial temporal relationship between the radars and integrate this idea to the joint labor fusion. And finally, we can yield the more consistent segmentation results across different time uh, time point. And another important thing is that uh, the sensitivity is still good. The Q change across time point, we can still keep the sensitivity. OK, uh, I just introduced the multi-atlas labor fusion. And now I introduce the method that we would like to speed up the multi-atlas labor fusion which is uh, called the multi atlas learner fusion, which enables us to perform it based on image data. So let's go back to this uh, multi atlas segmentation framework. The registration takes uh, 22 hours. The uh, labor fusion takes 14 hours. So we would like to get rid of all these time consuming part and to have the eight minute solution of the multi atlas learner. All right. <clears throat> Think about it, if we want to do the 3 sound image segmentation and multiple by 36 hours, we need 12.5 years if you have only one computer. Why? Because the even uh, my brain looks similar to your brain, but it's still fundamentally different, which means the registration takes a lot of time. And also, when we do the multi atlas label fusion, the state of art method to do the non-local search, which not only do the corresponding voxel, but also find the neighborhood. So this part is also time consuming. So we can simulate it like this situation. If I want to uh, reach the, my face to President Obama's face, it's very challenging. We need a lot of like nice non uh, rigid situation. But if we want to reach this guy's face to President Obama, well, it's a way easier job. So that's our motivation to do this easy job to get out of registration. So what we do is we first do the multi assimilation on three sound patient, and we map the feature to the PCA domain like this figure, and we can see these two neighborhoods. A looks like to each other, B looks like to each other. So when the new target image comes, 
we can do the PCA to map it to this PCA map and using the neighborhood image as well as a multi atlas implementation as our new atlases. Now we have several segmentations. Then we use the uh, Adaboost learning to fuse the final segmentation, which is uh, much better than any of the individual. And here is the method of the Adaboost machine learning that we have target, we have training data from the PCA, and we do the iterative uh, Adaboost learning, basically X and Y. Basically, this is a typical problem for the machine learning. We define X as coordinates, intensity in the neighborhood, the labels in the neighborhood, and the Y is the label in the target image. Once we have this training data, we have this iterative uh, training strategy, basically give the each decision tree a different weight and in the testing stage we can get pretty decent things. and here is the results we can see uh, the test for is our adverse learning which is eight minutes and we compare with a method which not use non registration and non-local search we have way better performance and we compare the method the use you can see the yes means use use non-local search and this method use non registration you basically use one of them which is way slower, but we still beat them. But we still cannot beat this non-region non retrieval plus non-local search. All right, so can we do better? So can we have even better and more accurate segmentation method? Now we have the power of tool, deep learning. So for the deep learning, well, the most straightforward idea is to train the segmentation network, which have the encoder decoder to have the segmentation outputs like this. And the, the popular one called the segnet. And later people realize if we connect the encoder and decoder, we can have better segmentation results, <laughs> which is FCN and the UNET. Well, for the whole brain 3D segmentation, we would like to use 3D UNET. However, it's limited by GPU memory, which means we cannot put the high resolution, for example, one millimeter is tropic T1 with my image to the 3D unit. Okay, people to deal with this problem, people typically use patch based method or sliding window based method. However, using this method, people using a single network to learn the patch from all the spatial location, which makes the task very difficult and very difficult to beat the state of art multi segmentation. Well, to deal with that, we propose a new framework which is called Slant. The idea is to use multiple independent deep neural networks, each one corresponding to one particular spatial location. Using this method, we can fully take advantage of the uh, what we have accumulated in the traditional medical image processing like registration, info correction, and the label fusion. And this, net, this framework cannot work without this historically uh, accumulation and uh, now each region each network only responsible for one particular spatial region we try the slant 8 which is 2 by 2 by 2 non overlap strategy and also we try 3 by 3 by 3 which is slant 27 which is overlapped strategy and after we get overlapped image we can do the label fusion to fuse the all these together to have the final results and uh, uh, in this strategy, the black one is the background, and we don't consider those uh, black voxels into the label fusion. And finally, we can get uh, results, which is better than each individual results. And we to train this network, because the issue is that we only have limited training data. In this case, we only have 45 uh, fully manual labeled uh, whole brain images. And it's also the limitation of the deep learning for whole brain segmentation that we don't have enough training data. And we use the auxiliary learning, which means we first apply the NLS segmentation on one of 5,000 brain. Then we use these uh, several standard uh, manual segmentation, not manual, several standard segmentation as the training data to train our network. Here's the idea is that we have 5,000 almost good segmentation to train the network. Then we use the 45 that we have to fine tuning the network. And to do the fine tuning, uh, the parameter of the entire network will update it. Here is the experiment design we compare with the multi segmentation, we compare it with uh, patch based deep learning method and the 3D unit. 
and we compare it with registration plus unit and also strand 8 and strand 27 either we only use 5000 uh, automatic sanitation labels or we combine the automatic and the manual labels so here is the qualitative results and the quantitative results and we are exciting that our new method is more uh, precise uh, in terms of dye similarity compared with the multi assimilation and with other deep learning methods. And here is also the quantitative results shows that our method achieved the best performance. Here's a publication of the multi assimilation fusion side, and uh, we find that a lot of car companies really like the words like label fusion, atlas in our field. Here, we can introduce the next part, which is personalized image processing. Is that when we have a large data, we can do better for the person. Here is an example that we do the probabilistic atlas. Traditional way that we average all the atlas that we have, get the probabilistic atlas. But when we see each individual, we can see these two guys have very different ventricle. But we typically use the same probability atlas for these guys. Now, can we change the game that use the left uh, probably at us for the left one, right as the right one. And we wanted the super quick that each patient come, we can quickly provide them this public atlas. So to do that, we design the dictionary learning the framework that we learn a dictionary of each uh, anatomical structure of each region and the probability atlas. And when a new target image come, we just from a faster rigid retreation, which takes less than five minutes, we can get the probabilistic atlas for each people. Like this is the results of our probabilistic atlas. And you can see if we directly use this probability atlas to do sanitation using threshold, our probability atlas is way better than the traditional uh, group based atlas. Now let's move to the population analysis that we would like to use all these methods to do some population analysis. The first thing that we would like to have as detailed as a fe possible feature from a single T1 weighted MR. Well, to do that, the free surface is the state of the art method, which can give us whole presentation on the surface. And more important, they're consistent with each other, which enable us to use all the features. But when we apply the free surface on the elderly population here on the BSA data set from the NIH NIA, we can see the free surface failed in typically 5%. Well, we have thought that, well, if we know that multi assimilation is pretty robust for this cohort, so can we combine the multi assimilation with the surface reconstruction? Another thought is in this free surface everywhere age, we don't want to do something different because it's boring that everyone uses free surface. So first we try to have the multi assimilation we get the gray matter and the white matter to reconstruct the surface. The inner surface is the boundary between white matter and the gray matter. The outer surface is the boundary between gray matter and the background. We use the Cruz method, which developed by Dr. Jerry Prince's group in uh, Johns Hopkins University. And we organize them together, see, well, they're consistent with each other, but we can see there are some imperfectness due to the partial volume effect or limitation by the atlas based sensation. So this is consistent, but in well, we would like to introduce a new sensation, which introduced the fuzzy sensation to give the fuzzy membership for the gray matter, white matter. Then we combine the fuzzy membership with the multi sensation. Then we do the surface construction to get the accurate surface and finally go back to correct the original multi assimilation to get the better sensation. We call this multi atlas cruise, MA cruise. As a result, we get a consistent and accurate whole presentation on the surface during construction. So the idea is to integrate previous independent multi assimilation and the cortical reconstruction to an integrated framework. And then we get consistent volume and surface sensation. We get more accurate surface, we get better sensation, and we hopefully this method robust elderly population. So here is the method. First, we do the multi sanitation and do the toads fuzzy membership sanitation, and we fuse the, the sanitation for the surface reconstruction. And then we use the level set based method uh, called MAACE, which is developed based on the, the ACE method to do the surface reconstruction. Then we do the uh, volume correction based on the surface. Basically, for the voxel outside our outer surface, we correct that background. For the voxel inside the inner surface, we crack it at the white matter. 
for the voxels between outer and inner surface, we correct it as the cortical labels. And uh, finally, we also do the surface parcellation based on the volume labels and the whole brain surface to get uh, 98 ROIs on the whole brain surface. And here is the surface accuracy that we achieved the comparable performance with the free surfer and the cruise using this semi cruise strategy. And for the segmentation, we consistently have better segmentation performance than the JRF and the LSS using the MACRUS. And we try this method on 200 elderly population cohort, and we find 11 patients has inconsistent segmentation, which means at least one method fail or on this uh, cohort. And we visualize all these 11 subjects, and we can see all the failures from either cruise or free surfer. And then our MR cruise is very consistent on this uh, elderly population. And also, we evaluated the surface parcellation result is that uh, our uh, method achieved very high reproducibility on the inner surface, central surface, outer surface, and the cortical. Surface. All right. Now we can have the metrics for y dimension. And now we want to correct them on the x domain. What do we do is we use the TICV, which is total intracranial volume. Well, the TICV has been widely used in the neuroscience as a covariance because it can reduce intersubject variation and they regress out the gender, race, hand, field strengths, even other that people have not really know. And also the most important is that TVCV TICV only calculated from the single T1 with the image, which means you don't need to collect the gender race, those kind of information. And we know that we cannot collect all the information for all the patients. So using TICV, you don't need to throw away any patients and you can use all images. So here's a toy example that if we do the whole brain uh, volume regression, we can see the male's brain is systematically bigger than the female's brain. But after the TICV correction on the volume, this difference almost disappear. Well, why do we want to develop our own TICV segmentation method rather than just use the tools provided by FSL, Free Surface, and SPN? Here is the reason that it's very difficult to distinguish SCAR and the CSF boundary from the single T1 with the image. And the Free Surface website also admitted that what we are doing is not determining where the skull is the kind of voxel inside the skull where this would be the best way to do it well it's the best way to but it's difficult to distinguish the skull and the csf since both star can on the t1 within so what we, is we want to do is this hard piece we want to first know where the voxel is then count to the voxels here is a method that we first have acquire uh, 20 subjects with both MR and the CT, and since the skull is very clear in CT, we use that label to propagate in the MRI. Then we have the ground truth of the TICV and the skull. Then we use multi segmentation to use this atlas and to get the final TICV segmentation, which have the voxels, voxel-wise segmentation for TV. And we can count to the voxels inside TICV to get the TICV volume. And uh, we can see the results is that the multi segmentation family, which are different label fusion strategy, they consistently better than free surfer or SPM. And our NSS method achieved the best result. Well, now we have why we correct the variation at X. Now we can do some uh, data mining or statistical analysis on large patient or large healthy population. This is a large scale. Well, the topic we are doing is brain volume tree, which basically find the relationship between the brain volume and age. The idea is that we have a T1 with the image, we do the multi segmentation or deep learning segmentation, we can get the whole brain volume or the volume from each piece, and we map the volume and the age on the 2D dimension. And once we do this for, for example, 45 people, we can have this projection and we can fit a line, which is the relationship between brain volume and age. Well, traditionally, this brain volume tree study was typically uh, conducted on small population. And now, we can easily have large population. For example, we acquired the data from uh, different resources, which is 5,000 images. And now, to summarize, traditionally, people typically do study 
uh, less than 200 skins, limited age range, age range because traditional people focus on particular age range, and the data typically acquired from a single scanner. In that case, the polynomial regression is good enough, but now we are dealing with large cohort, which is 5,000 uh, across the lifespan from year 4 to 89, and these data are acquired from more than 60 scanners. What can we do? So to do with that, we developed the CRCS method, which is covariate adjusted restricted cubic spline regression method. Let me introduce the CRCS method. Here we make a toy example that simulates the brain change that on most of the space, the brain change slow, but in particular space, brain change way faster, like the young or adulthood. Here we can see that if we try the polynomial n equals to three, we can get a pretty good uh, regression on general, but we cannot capture the rapid change. So the one strategy to increase the order, well, we have n equals to nine. Well, in this case, we can capture the peak better, but we have overfitting on three. To deal with that, people propose the cubic spine regression, which have the knots on the entire domain and just fit the cubic curves between the knots, which uh, separate the hard piece to several small, easy fitting pieces. Well, we can still see that it's overfitting on the boundary. And then people propose this RCS method, which force the linearity at the boundaries. Now we have the pretty decent fitting on the entire lifespan. The trick is that the linear linearity at the boundaries at these two errors. But in our situation, we may have some linear confounds like the age, like the scanner effect at the strength, field strength effect. If we consider those effects, the RCS cannot fit a good line if we have linear effect. So we propose the CRC method, which add a covariate term to the RCS method, and we prove that it still satisfies the linear, linearity requirements. And in this case, we can get pretty decent results by covariate those kind of variables. So the good thing is that it's simple because it's piecewise polynomial. It's flexible. It's on the GM framework, and our collaborators they love GM, and this is powerful. Which we have a local fitting power, and we can add our covariates. Here is the validation. So we do the multi assimilation and we get the Hobian volume and the network of interests. Then we do the uh, volume metric trajectory on uh, more than 10,000 bootstrap. So here is the example of Hobian volume. We define the knots from our collaborator, which uh, we define knots from the publications. And once we have knots, we can have the feeding. And now we want to see if our feeding method and the knots make sense. What we do is we use 10,000 bootstrap and to see how big the change is when we just resample the data. And finally, we can get the confidence interval of the bootstrap. As a result, we can see our feeling is pretty robust because the confidence interval is pretty. And the first validation is on Hoban volume. We have data, we have the fitting, we have the confidence interval. We can see the confidence interval is pretty small. And we also want to compare this finding with previous studies especially the small age range, small cohort studies. And we, to do that, we calculate the brain growth rate, which is typically provided by previous studies. And the growth rate larger than zero means brain growth, smaller than zero means brain decrease. And we have the confidence interval. And then we compare with 20 previous studies, which see our finding is pretty consistent with previous small scale analysis. And once we have this image processing to data analysis tool, we can apply it on the brain aging, which we're interested in the lifespan brain change. Now we applied on 15 networks of interests. Here we can see, well, we can fit the model on 15 MOIs. Some related to language, some related to visual, some related to um, motor, etc. And the interesting for me is that we look at the language part. The language part increased so fast until 10, then decreased so fast until 30. And after 30, we typically have the similar brain cells as uh, 80, 90 years old people on the language function. Which answer my question is that why even I've already stayed in this state for many years, my English is still poorer than the elementary school young kids, because I've already passed the best time to learn the language. and. If, for example, if you learn English or practicing it after 20, 
well, you basically, the ability of you learn English is similar like 80 years old people. Well, we have this qualitative uh, visualization. Can we quantify this relationship between the different curves? What do we do is we do the piecewise semitation on the, the entire curve using the knots that we define. For example, for NOI1, the ch shape change a between age and 7 and 12 is like this. But for other NOIs, we may have other trends like increase and decrease, uh, purely decrease, etc. Then we can find the cross correlation between the shapes and we can define the distance between y minus the correlation and give the confidence interval of the connection. The connection tells us which region has a similar growth pattern as other region and which region has a very different growth pattern. And we have this interval and we can visualize it across the lifetime and we can see well which one grows in a similar pattern as which one. We can even visualize it better that we can do the CRC method on the most detailed level on 132 regions. That we can see the red means this region reaches largest volume, the blue means that this region reaches the smallest volume. We can visualize okay across the age which brand grows first, which brand decreases first, which region and which region has similar growth pattern. And this is the same video as previous slides, just rotated. Yeah, we can see the uh, brain volume change from uh, five years old to 80. Okay, now I move to the abdomen part. So first I want to introduce the spleen amygdala segmentation. So as we know, the normal spleen is typically less than 500 cc, but for some patient who has a liver and a spleen disease, the spleen volume can be far, lar way larger than 500 cc. And we collaborate with a, a pharmaceutical company, which they want is they want to develop the automatic cementation method, which can get the spleen volume size. Then uh, they have people to have the medication across different time point and to see if the volume shrink or decrease. So if they have the automatic method, they don't need to hire people to do the time consuming manual tracing. And this is our purpose. But the spleen amygdala is very challenging because from this uh, generally you can see the spatial location, the shape, the volume size are very different across different uh, people for the spleen amygdala. It can be 20 times different. And another difficulty is that we are now dealing with MRI rather than the CT that the traditional average image is. Uh, well, and even worse that this cohort consists of at least seven different uh, sequence type. You can see some spring are white, some spring are dark, so it's a very challenging task to do this. And even worse, we have only 60 data with the 45 as training and the 15 as testing, and the training contains half T1, half T2 testing, also can have T1, T2. So can we do automatic simulation on this data? Let's briefly review the history. The people started to use probabilistic atlas then statistical shape model, graph cut to the whole presentation, and they recently they use multi segmentation and now deep learning. First, we use the multi segmentation which developed our lab to do the cinematic segmentation. Here is different pipelines. We can try, okay, if we directly do the label fusion, it's fully automatic method. If we um, do that as selection, which is simple method, <coughs> we can get a segmentation. Okay, what do we do if we do the manual sem selection using the cr cranial cardio lens? Uh, the error is basically the lens between top of uh, the spring and the bottom spring. We can get another result, and finally, can we use our proposed method, which combine the automatic method and the manual method together? It's semi-automatic method. To see the performance. So here is our simple. We have the uh, rigid atlas. We can get the spatial prior. Then we can do the voting to get the intermediate voting results. And then we go back to select the atlas again to do the radius EM based method. And here is the figure illustrate the results. If we use 
if we get this segmentation, which dies at 0.75, uh, if we use the simple method, we can get the results like the uh, pink rectangle. If we use the manual measurement L, we can get this green result. And if we use L plus simple, we can get almost all these best candidates for the label fusion. And here is the qualitative result. And this is the quantitative results. This is accuracy. We can see our method has less outliers and better dice than the previous method. Okay, now we have a powerful tool, deep learning. So we try if this can fully leverage of splitting the megalith segmentation. And what we do is similar as brain that we have a network. We have a station different networks, and now we first try the unit, the 2D unit. Now we have the segmentation results for unit and the brain, and since it has large spatial variation for splitting the migraine, for some people we have these outliers, which has bad segmentation. Well, then we try the FCN. The idea of the FCN is to use the uh, add rather than the concatenation in the skip connection. And we inspired by the work in the CVPR 2017 that they proposed the global convolutional kernel. The idea is to revisit segmentation as a classification problem. If we go to the voxel-wise, this segmentation is actually a voxel-wise classification. Once we have the label, which is classification for each voxel, we can get the segmentation. Well. Since it's a classification problem, we want to have the spatial invariance. For example, you want to classify the figure as a cat or dog, we want to have a network that no matter where the cat or dog is, we can still tell it's a cat or dog. But it's also a segmentation problem because as we want to fully use the spatial information, for example, you know our liver is always on the right, our spleen is always on the left. We want to fully use this information to help the segmentation. So we want to uh, alleviate this contradictory part to alleviate that the GCN provide us a solution that they use the large kernel, which basically see more things have larger valid uh, field of view. But to speed up, they use two one-dimensional kernel to simulate the 2D large kernel which enable us to both see larger and see quicker. And here we try using the GCN network to get a segmentation. And we can see some isolated pixels or bad segmentations. Well, it's okay. We can use post-processing to deal with that. But can we do that in the end-to-end -end format? We inspired by another work which used a diverser networks, which used the GAN as a loss to help the supervised learning. Here is the paper results that if you have input like this, you have ground truth. If you don't have gain loss, you get this noisy results, but if you have gain loss, you have much better results. The idea is the gain tells you if it's real or not. So if you can make the gain trust you, you can have pretty uh, more realistic image. Here we add the adversary loss to our generator, play as discriminator. And in, we do this uh, training and uh, using the true or false as a discriminator, then we can get the pretty uh, decent segmentation. Here is the gain loss that we use. Traditional people use image gain, which basically tell me choose false for one image. Now we do the patch gain, basically we can have each patch, which tells us, okay, each patch is true or false. Here we have the true or false for each patch. Well, this is our segmentation network. We have the mm, GCN as our generator. We have the uh, dice loss out as our image loss. And we have the patch gain as our gain loss. So finally, we can alleviate the isolated pixel and the smooth the segmentation boundary. And here is the experimental design that we have <clears throat> these training data. The first thing we try, we only use actual view images, which use uh, these view images. Another example that we use all three views and fuse the net result together to have the final results. 
and we don't use any pre-trained network. And we can see on left panel is the results of different method using only axial view image. Right side is use both stream. And we can see the quantitative results shows our method is always consistent better than the previous method. Well, we now have the Atlas method. We now have the deep learning method. Let's compare the results. We can see our deep learning method is better in terms of medium and mean dice. And for the dice less than 0 0.8, now we have zero compared with six in the multi assimilation. And also we apply this method to the multi-organ simulation. Now we can have multiple organ simulations simultaneously and we made that as a, a clinical report which tell, show the doctor's patient, show the 3D rendering and show the organ size for different organs. The next thing is that we try the deep synthesis learning. The image synthesis was widely used in the computer vision community that you can synthesize the horse from zebra or vice versa. But in, in the medical image, we can do a similar thing to synthesize between image analysis. Here is the synthesis learning that if you have a CT image, right? So you want to uh, synthesize a MI image from the CT or from CT to MI. The issue is that no matter how good your synthesized image is, the doctors cannot use your synthesized image directly in the clinical diagnosis because there's some risk. Now to deal with that, we need to go one step further, which we this work we design the segmentation network using synthesized image, which now we provide segmentation and people can use that in the research or the clinical practice. The idea is that now we want to do the CT segmentation, splitting segmentation. Well, we don't have spleen omegaly labels on CT. What can we do? Well, basically, we can hire people to do the spleen omegaly label tracing. Then we use those ground truths to train the network. But we don't want to use that since we already have, from my, my previous, you know that we already have the labels in MI. We just want to fully take advantage of these labels and don't want to hire people to trace the CT again. What we do is we propose this is synthesis and segmentation network, which we can train a network using the MI image, CT image, and MI label to do the CT segmentation. And the important thing is that the MI and the CT are unpaired. And the previous effort on this topic is that people do this in two stage model. First, they synthesize MI from CT or CT from MI. <clears throat> then they use the label in, in this work. They use the label in CT and the synthesize MI to train the MI segmentation network. This is two stage network, basically do the synthesis and the segmentation into independent network. But from our perspective, this should be in one network because if you have good synthesis, you can have better segmentation. If you have better segmentation, you have better synthesized images. So we think if we do it in the end to end manner, it should give us better results. The basic idea is to, to network together in the end-to-end -end manner. Now let me briefly introduce our network. First, it's very si similar to the cycle game, is that we have the real MI, we have the generator to simulate a CTMI, at the CT scan. Now we can use again to see, okay, if a CT is true or false, then we can have another generator to further go back to simulate the fake MI from the fake CD, then we can compare, okay, if after this loop, if we get consistent results between the true MI and the simulated MI. This is the first loop, and also we can have the true CT to have the simulated MI, to have the loss function, and we can simulate the for CT, then have the consistent loss for true and for CT. And we have another loss also, now let's think about how to train the segmentation network in an end-to-end -end manner. Now we have the synthesized the CT, we have the two menu label from MI, then we use the synthesized CT to input to a segmentation network to get the estimated segmentation and calculate the dice loss between these two guys or cross entropy. Now we have the segmentation loss. To sum, we have two get loss, we have two cycle loss and one segmentation loss and we give them different weights and sum them together to have our final
here is output from our network. We have the uh, generate the CT from real MI, have the reconstructed MI, have the CT segmentation. We can also have the generated MI from the CT and the reconstruct CT. Here is experiment design. Now we use um, 17, uh, 19 CT scans, who is has spinning megaly has testing data. And in the training strategy, we use a network that's only trained by the healthy people to see what's going on. And also we have this best practice strategy that we, if we have the two label in CT, what can we have? We use multi-atlas and the deep learning method. And the, finally, we use the synthesis plus segmentation idea, which is two-stage idea, without have any ground truth in the CT spline amygdala, and also our pre proposed end-to-end -end And this is uh, 60 data that we have. We have 19 CT, and uh, we do the pre-processing for both to normalize them to 0 to 1 scale, and we train them on because we don't have enough data to train a 3D network. Here is the qualitative results that if we use small spin or uh, traditional method, we cannot get very good results. But we use the uh, synthesis plus segmentation network, well, we not only get spin segmentation. Remember, we have multiple labels in MI. Now we can get the multi-organ segmentation. And his quantitative results is that look at the blue one is we use CT trans CT, and the, uh, the brown one is if we have two stage mo model. So we don't have CT trans CT. And the last the red one is our end to end manner. That we are significantly better than two stage method and achieve the non statistically significant performance compared with ground truth. Which means if you don't want to do the manual segmentation for the modality and you already had an image from previous modality, you can use this method to reduce the manual effort you need for the segmentation network. And here, I want to briefly introduce a clinical application that we want to do investigate the uh, surgical planning. Basically, we have three different methods for the kidney stone removal. We can have the micro, uh, the shock wave, the, the nice surgery, and the more invasive surgery. Uh, basically, 25% of the people need the surgery, but we want to have the good surgical plan for these kind of patients because now the doctors just based on the experience, experience on the MRI or CT images, then they do the surgical planning. But if we can quantify the uh, renal collection system, for example, if this is stone, we can decide, okay, we use option one. If this is stone, we use probably two or even three. Now we have the tool, which is contrast the CT, which we can clearly see the renal collecting system from the C. And for using our previous method, we can get the kidney segmentation. And then we can do this advanced method. And traditionally, people try to do that, but what they do is either visualize in 2D or get the 2D measurements. And what we want to do is have the 3D visualization and the 3D. Here we use our PRISM method to get the kidney segmentation. Once we have that, we crop that region and using the simple uh, Gaussian mesh model to get basically three classes from the CT images. Uh, kidney tissue, the renal collecting system, and other tissues. Renal collecting system and the kidney and the map them into the 3D rendering and we can have the three key points from uh, the 3D rendering and then we can measure the IPA the angle in the 3D manner and we can get the uh, radius of curvature and the lower pole pathway. Using this quantitative information, we can do the better surgical plan. And this is collaboration between us and uh, the doctors. Well, this is another topic is called multitask learning that we have recently accomplished. The idea is to, okay, previously we most talk about segmentation and then now in this work, we want to do other things like the landmark detection, basically the detection problem and the classification. In this case, we would like to uh, classify the image acquired from the ultrasound 
to 11 different categories and we also want to do the landmark detection for each organ simultaneously so basically this is doing two tasks classification and landmark detection together and we call this multi-learning and to do that we use a network like this basically the uh, the main uh, network is GCN then in the first work we do the landmark detection which use the image to image network uh, image to image loss for all the channels and we also do the classification on the encoder part at the left side then we have a multiple loss function to this network and eventually we have uh, better results than the previous method compared with the uh, manual sanitation from the doctors and here is uh, the correction rates so the human has 78 percent accuracy the single test learning 81 percent and the multi-test learning is 85 percent and the, the uh, landmark error basically is the distance between uh, the true landmark and our automatic method is typically yield less than five millimeter and we can see that the interhuman variation is even larger than our method which means our method achieved generally the doctor level performance on this multitask and this is collaboration work between Siemens, Hausner and uh, our Massey lab uh, basically Joe Bean is a, a research scientist and me we are a co first author of this paper which uh, recently accepted by Mikhail now finally well we want to introduce our platform which enable all the previous studies happen because now we are dealing with big medical image data we need to have the better platform think about if we do each subject for 10 hours one hour etc if you multiply by thousands or ten thousand it's 10 years or even longer so what we do is we have the this platform which we have the input directly from scanner database internet or workstation we push those automatically to the XNet uh, then we design a framework called the DAX which can automatically assign the task, image processing task for the image that are pushed to the XNet and we deployed our image segmentation detection or all this algorithm on the DAX then we can push the code to the acre which is super compute super computing center in Vanderbilt University and we can do all the computation on the supercomputer then we push all these results back to the XNet and we can do focus on the analysis after we uh, define our method another advantage of this method and framework is that uh, our code is version controlled in this framework that even the PhD or researcher who develop this method leave our lab we can still make sure the, the algorithm work as it should be and the right side shows the number of the processors which is image processing runs uh, increased dramatically from 2013 to, to 2017 and the basic idea is that give me MRI or CT scan for brain or abdomen then you just simply choose okay for this PI which kind of analysis that we need and we have this strategy to finally give you not only segmentation output or landmark coordinates etc but also give you PDFs like this is for five different methods show the visualization visualization results quantitative results etc to make the QA analysis etc much easier so to sum I introduce uh, my PhD work for brain and for abdomen and uh, we developed the image processing algorithm and for the data analysis algorithm so in the future well we can do the large-scale brain spleen liver etc for other organs and we can do more detection like lung cancer detection kidney stone detection and also we can define the human abdomen space to make the abdomen work much easier and I would like to thank the committee thank our department thank all the funding resources which make this work
and also want to send to the lab members, the faculty staff, with our uh, PhD student, alumni. So I cannot do all this stuff without your help. And uh, I want to thank the lab and my pretty daughters. And thank you for your attention for this presentation.